retrieve what we have lost. Light and darkness reunite. The duality is resolved. At the end of every Black Ops Zombies life cycle, we're presented with what will inevitably become the game's final content drop. This is one of the most important moments for the game, as it's the last opportunity for Treyarch to show off their talents and leave the community with a positive, lasting impression until the next Zombies mode comes around. Generally speaking, the expectations for a moment such as this are set sky high. The Ether storyline was approaching its 10-year anniversary, and at this point in time, the developers thought it would be wise to bring everything to a close and move on to something different. But when framing things this simplistically, it doesn't quite paint an accurate picture. Because while DLC 4 is a deck of cards which is stacked against the developers, it's important to remember that this situation needs to be analyzed from a Black Ops 4 lens. But in the case of Tagged or Toten, this DLC represented so much more as this was closing the book on the Aether storyline. The true challenge that the Zombies team was up against was arguably more difficult than anything else that they had faced throughout their entire careers, and this was figuring out a way to ensure community satisfaction. Because while Zombies is Treyarch's creation, it's also very much our game as well. Every weekend you spent playing with your best friends late into the night, watching our favorite content creators hunt for easter eggs on a midnight DLC release, and even the playful frustrations the community felt after watching Jason Blundell during another cryptic interview. That's what Treyarch was really up against, an investment of time and emotion. This was no longer the standard DLC 4 that they were used to creating. It had morphed into to something entirely new, a goal of carefully crafting a farewell to all of our youthful memories. And when the immense emotional expectations of the community are injected and mixed with the burden of the Black Ops 4 developmental issues, it seems like being set up to fail is an understatement. This was an obstacle that was so impenetrable that there was only one option to bring about any modicum of success. And in order to achieve it, Treyarch needed to let go of any and all assumptions that the community was holding on to. Tagged or Toten was more than just a final Zombies map. It was the 10 year culmination of every bit of content that developers had created, the summation of every memory made by a fan, and a blend of every expectation set in the minds of everyone who loves this mode. But after four years have passed and the dust has settled, what is the actual reality of the situation? Did Tagged or Toten fail to live up to the community standards? Has the map aged well, and did it do its duty in wrapping up the Ether storyline? Make sure to stick around as we will answer all of these questions and so much more. This is Tagged or Toten. Quick reminder that this is episode 4 of an 8 part series for the Black Ops 4 Zombies retrospective that we're doing here on the channel, so make sure to check the link in the description below to view the whole entire playlist. Thank you so much for watching, back to the video. In early spring of 2019, leaks and rumors began to flood the internet about what the remaining DLC maps for the Aether story would be, and a lot of information was coming forward from Eric Maynard of the Woo Lads, and it seemed like only more bad news for the community was incoming. According to his sources, Treyarch was planning on finalizing the first Black Ops pass with a Nuketown and Call of the Dead remake. Looking back, this information was obviously correct, but I think it's very important to adjust our perspective as to what Treyarch's initial plans may have been. I don't think it's a secret that Treyarch wanted to have multiple seasons of Zombies content following the end of the Black Ops 4 life cycle. But after doing my research, re-watching old news videos, and using hindsight, I think there is a reasonable explanation as to what Treyarch's overarching goal actually was. While this is pure conjecture, I believe the Chaos storyline was meant to be the original content inside of Black Ops 4. This would leave the Ether maps to supplement as Zombies Chronicles 2, but be reimagined with Easter eggs, gauntlets, and the modern gameplay mechanics. This would have killed many birds with one stone by allowing for about a half a dozen original Chaos maps for Season 1, half a dozen or so main Ether storyline remakes for Season 2, and then the remaining Victus maps and possible faithful remakes of Mob and Call of the Dead for Zombies Chronicles 2. This, of course, would all end with Chaos carrying the torch into the future and leaving us with so much Ether content we'd be beside 
ourselves. While there will always be opposing viewpoints as to whether or not Ether was supposed to have original content, fans will never know with absolute certainty. It does slightly seem like Treyarch had always planned to finalize the Ether storyline with reimaginings of classic maps. This would be for both purposes of breathing new life into these fan-favorite experiences, but to also tell a masterful story, which we will touch on in a few moments. And while it's always fun to speculate about the inner workings of video game development, we can only truly judge what is right here in front of us. Which brings us to Operation Dark Divide. Treyarch has always been known for their developer interviews and inside baseball commentary, and they continued to go all out with Black Ops 4, giving fans these fantastic live streams that broke down the contents of what we could expect at the end of the road. DLC 4 is always a special one. It's, um, it's the end of each arc, right? DLC 4, your expectations, your stories kind of built to a certain point. Uh, it's also the place where we give you a couple of zingers. That's a place where we, uh, we challenge the community. And this being the very end of the Ether story, uh, means we got a surprise in store for, for everyone. Only a few months had passed after the launch of Alpha Omega, and Treyarch had been hard at work behind the scenes putting together what would become the closing chapter of their epic 10-year saga. And even with the animated trailers dropping beforehand, there still was nothing concrete stating that we were going to Call of the Dead or that we were playing as Victus, as Primus and Ultimus were in an entire different location, or at least it appeared that way. And while the lack of clarity in the community was becoming more in focus, it always helps to hear things straight from the horse's mouth. As we pick up the Ether story after the events of Alpha Omega, we now have Ultimus and Primus working together. That was a really, really fun map to do. But really, to get to the end of the story, it becomes apparent that they also are going to want a little bit more help. And that's where Victus comes in. So when players get to Tagged or Toned, they're going to immediately recognize this is an iconic classic location from a previous Call of Duty map, Call of the Dead. But that something's different about it. While initial reception was mixed, it was great to receive the official statement about returning to Call of the Dead as well as playing as Victus. But as I have stated many times throughout this series, Treyarch dumped all of their eggs into the Chaos storyline basket. And considering the 10-year finale of Aether was timed perfectly with Black Ops 4, fans were so perplexed and angered at the proposition of their favorite story taking a back seat for something entirely new and unforeseen. And as a result, there was a stress fracture inside of Treyarch due to rabid backlash against developers, a forceful financial pivot from Activision, and a premature developmental takeover for Black Ops Cold War. This combination of events perpetuated some last-minute decision-making which forced asset creation and new gameplay mechanics out of the spotlight. But even with all of Black Ops 4's missteps, the anticipation of this conclusion was immensely exciting for fans. And while the confirmation of this fourth map stung, it's clear that the backlash from the community was dampened by the bittersweet nature of this being the last map. Been on this wild ride for zombies for so long, again, over a decade of making zombies, and to see the Ether storyline finally come to a conclusion, it's pretty emotional. Um, there's, there's been so much, so many ups and downs, so many different maps, and so many stories that we've told within the larger narrative. It's actually pretty exciting for fans and, and the hardcore zombies community to really experience this final map for us. At the end of the day, Treyarch doesn't want to serve us bad zombies content, and if they could, they would bring us anything and everything we could ever ask for. And while there may have been cutbacks in certain places, Treyarch made sure to do their best in other areas to make up for the game's shortcomings. Tagged or Toten might just be one of the most beautiful Ether maps of all time. It competes with some of the other fantastic designs from the modern zombies era, such as Blood of the Dead, Revelations, and even Shadows of Evil. There's just something about it that has you staring out into the the calming unknown of this isolated Siberian outpost in between the hordes of the undead attempting to snuff you out of existence. It is impossible not to imagine the warmth from the orange and pink glow of the sunrise while also feeling the chill of the Element 115 pumping through the icy blue veins of the snow-covered rocks. Treyarch nailed the atmosphere here and it feels absolutely phenomenal to exist in this space. Players were now able to explore behind the lighthouse and the boat with new various tunnels and paths pathways bridging the gaps on the ground below, leaving the zipline system to cover the skies. Something interesting to note is that Treyarch didn't really expand the map as much as they did with Blood of the Dead in comparison to Mob of the Dead. What they did instead was build the map upward, and when conceptualizing the map being played in three dimensions, it actually is a little larger than it appears at first glance. But aside from the lab, the new spaces that the devs added weren't really new in the same way that adding new industries or the Warden's House was for Blood. It just feels like Treyarch gave us a few more more playable areas down below to fill out what Call of the Dead couldn't at the time, likely due to hardware limitations. 
Funny enough, this map feels quite a bit different than its predecessor from 2011. Now, of course I won't compare the two on graphics and art direction alone, but it is jarring to look at the two side by side as I don't think a regular person would be able to tell that they're from the same location without prior knowledge. Call of the Dead had such a cold and gray tone, not just in art direction but in spirit. Every time I hop into a match of Call of the Dead, I feel this chill up my spine, it's almost instinctual, like my lizard brain is telling me to be cautious as there's danger up ahead. Tagged or Toten lost that feeling in a lot of ways, but to be fair, Zombies hasn't been about horror in a long while. But it would be dishonest of me to say that Treyarch did not attempt to add in some darker themes into this map, as the entire Group 935 laboratory is playable in this tiny Siberian outpost. This lab area is such a great addition to the map as it allows for multiple spaces to run around and train and contains multiple quest steps and new gameplay mechanics. But what makes the lab even more special is that it has deep storyline implications that originate all the way back to Call of the Dead and is the sole reason George Romero sought this location in the first place for his film. Years ago, I did research for a World War II movie. I came across some old Nazi documents. I couldn't believe what I was reading. Element 115, necromancers, raising the dead, real creepy stuff. We're completely surrounded! Come on! The coolest thing? Some of that crazy shit happened right here. These Nazi documents that George stumbled upon, the experiments he is referencing, this is Tag Der Toten. It all started years prior when Richthof had learned about the Agarthen device, a device so powerful that he himself could control the ether. A genie in a bottle, he called it. He had found information stating that in order to bring it to fruition, he needed three things. The Vril Vessel, the Elemental Shard, and Apothecan Blood. And the whole reason Richthofen ever learned about the Agarthen device is because of an excavation that occurred with Group 935 in Africa when they discovered an American Western themed town underground. This area is known to many of us Zombies fans as the map Buried. While Group 935 was searching this town, they discovered the Vril Vessel, which we know now was created by Jebediah Brown, the same man who made the Pack-a-Punch machine. Years had passed and Richthofen began working at the 935 laboratory in Siberia, performing experiments on his human test subjects. These men were known as Takio Masaki, Nikolai Blinsky, and Pablo Marinus. As the experiments continued, Pablo was undergoing surgery by the hand of Richthofen and Harvey Yina. Unfortunately, Yina's hand slipped during an abscission, causing Richthofen to make a mistake, which in turn yielded Pablo's demise. Shortly after, Tank Dempsey was brought to Richthofen as a replacement subject, and it was then that Edward created the elemental shard from the three remaining test subjects' souls, along with his own essence. Richthofen now possessed both the elemental shard and the Vril Vessel, and now all he needed was the Apothecan blood. But before he could ever complete his mission, Maxis sent the shard away, which is why we went to eventually retrieve it at Camp Edward inside of Alpha Omega. Eventually, Harvey Yina left Group 935, creating the Ascension Group, partnering with Dr. Gersh. After some time had passed, Ascension Group would receive a message from the old abandoned Siberian laboratory that revealed the location of the Apothecan blood via a set of coordinates. Since there were allegedly no survivors at this facility when Group 935 left, Yina sent a team to the lab to investigate and authenticate the validity of the transmission that he had received. The messenger was Pablo Marinus, aka The Hermit. While Richthofen and Yina thought he had died during surgery, it seems that he was preserved by the cold and did not die in this particular timeline, and he was also able to send out the message for Ascension Group to receive. After the message was verified, Yina and his men went to the location of the Pothican blood and siphoned it from an Elder God who was preserved in near-perfect condition. One of Pablo's requests was that the Ascension Group bring the blood back as quickly as possible once it was retrieved, but Yina and Gersh were enamored with the blood and couldn't stop mentioning how the blood appeared alive, as if it was its own entity. So they did what any corrupt scientist would do, they held it in captivity for further study, which only angered the blood, causing it to become more aggressive. Once the group had what they needed, they set sail back to Siberia to return the blood to the hermit. As they were just about to arrive safely at their location, the blood had grown irritable due to the captivity, broke free, and caused the ship to crash into the Siberian outpost. The entire prologue to Tagder Toten is one of the most masterfully woven pieces of storytelling 
storytelling I have ever experienced. Not only have Craig Houston and Jason Blundell accounted for nearly every detail across the span of 10 years worth of games, but they have created a subplot underneath it all through the comic book series. The comics kept an account for an entire series of events that explained why the cycle keeps repeating, why Victus is on ice, and provides context as to how Blood of the Dead begins as well. And now that Victus has awoken from their cryostasis, they are able to be used in Nikolai's grand scheme to restore order to the universe. And similarly to Alpha Omega, another animated cinematic begins to introduce Tagder Toten, which was quite unfortunate to say the least. The community likely knew this was going to happen since the support for Black Ops 4 zombies essentially vanished overnight, but we were all hoping that maybe, just maybe there would be something special planned. And as I mentioned, this was quite the bummer as the contents in the introductory sequence are quite enamoring and having an actual cinematic would have proved useful. After the Victus crew awakens, they begin to panic as zombies are pushing to break into the lab at the base of the prison. This is a bit confusing because it seems that Alcatraz as a pocket dimension was closed off after Richtofen died inside of the dark mechanism. So while I don't have the answer here as to why Alcatraz is still ongoing, my likely assumption is that the Victus we end up playing as was pulled out of another timeline. And as the zombies break into the lab and Victus is certain of their demise, zombie Richtofen opens up a teleporter and sends them to Siberia. At the same time as all of this is going on, we see Primus and Ultimus enjoying spirits in the frozen forest, celebrating one last time before the multiverse is shut down. The player also learns that the objective of the map is going to be to build the Agarthan device so that the ultimate power can be controlled to put everything and everyone back into their authentic state in the universe. However, Nikolai's plan appears to be quite ambiguous, and while it seems like everything is going to work out for the better, that could potentially not be the case when resolving this paradox. The intro cutscene ends with the player seeing all of Primus and Ultimus sleeping after a wild night of partying, with zombie Richtofen cackling over an open flame, the screen fading to black, and the player spawning into the map. I'm sure I sound like a broken record at this point, but one of my favorite parts of any and every zombies map is its spawn room. There is something truly fascinating about why Treyarch wants us to start in a particular location versus others. Maybe it's to gently push the player towards the game's narrative, or maybe it's to emphasize danger in a cinematic fashion, or maybe it's to simply show you that you are on the backside of the lighthouse that was once forbidden in Call of the Dead. Whatever trivial reason it may be, the player starts off with the sun blinding them, overlooking an icy dock with the undead slowly inching closer towards them. And to be quite frank, this is one of the most uninspired introductions to a map that we have ever had. And while the beauty of Tagder Toten is enthralling, it just feels so plain, and not to mention leaves all of the heavy lifting to Victus that introduced the players to the map. It's well known in the community at this point that development for the final Ether maps had been initiated by Treyarch with Jason Blundell, and then eventually transferred out of the US to be completed by Activision Shanghai. While it's inconclusive just how much Treyarch did or didn't do when it came to the development of both Alpha Omega and Tag, there is a stark difference between these two maps and the entirety of the rest of the maps inside of the game. Now, after extensively playing and completing both of these maps many times for these retrospectives, there is a commonality between Alpha Omega and Tag that was not as obvious to me during the game's life cycle in 2019. Both of the maps suffer with quirky easter egg design and gameplay mechanics that more or less clash with just how special and beautifully detailed the storyline is. There is a constant push and pull inside of the game that is very subtle, but it's there gnawing at the back of your mind. When beginning any of the Easter eggs in Black Ops 4, you are constantly being bombarded with these amazing set piece moments. Whether it's the catwalk opening in Blood of the Dead or the Pegasus sequence inside of Ancient Evil, there is always something right around the corner to keep you on your toes. But in parallel to how the player spawns in the map, there seems like a concerted effort to ensure the stakes are as low as possible in the early acts of the quest so that you really feel the pressures when it comes to a close. After making their way around the map, picking up shield pieces and turning on the initial two power switches, the player comes to a few items to slide into their never-ending pockets. Things like the wheel cranks and a large rock of Frozen 115 will inevitably lead the player to the top of the lighthouse, where they will be introduced to one of the most important characters in all of Zombies. While at this point in time he's just identifying as the Hermit, all signs indicate he's much more important than he is letting on. After 
landing the Hermit the 115 rock and setting the zip line straight, we are rewarded with the ability to pack a punch and ride the zip lines wherever we need to go. The first stop is to the labs behind the lighthouse on the cliffside, where the third power switch resides, along with the rich and troubled history of all of Richtofen's and Group 935's ravenous experiments on human test subjects to win the Second World War. It's at this point in the journey where multiple tasks begin to occur simultaneously. Experienced players will know that while you're preparing for other steps in this quest, that it is crucial to constantly be farming dynamite from the fire zombies so that you can always move right along to the next step without abrupt delay. You're also going to want to begin the Hermit Totem challenges as soon as possible to earn his trust so that the player can officially begin the Easter egg. Not to mention, it's wise to begin unlocking the Samantha music box as well as the Wonderwaffa DG Scharfeschutze as all these elements are needed to progress through the main quest. Every single one of these processes is quite bland and feels menial in comparison to some of the other quest steps throughout the Black Ops 4 zombie season. While none of it is particularly challenging, it's just so much busy work that it detracts from the importance of what this DLC actually means to the storyline. There is no pattern, no flow, no dots to be connected in some majestical way. This is, in my opinion, due to the fact that Treyarch did not have complete control over the gameplay development for these quest steps. And while there are a multitude of wonderfully written threads which weave so many narrative bits together, I can't help but feel a little disappointed when I see how the gameplay steps conveying them lack all heart and conviction. As stated prior, the quest officially begins once two of the Hermit's totem challenges are complete. The player can then make their way up to the lighthouse where he will send down four dials on his jerry-rigged pulley system to be picked up. These dials are to be taken over to the artifact storage area where the Apothecan blood is located underneath the shipwreck and set the dials to a specific number that can be found written in corresponding colors around the map. Or you can just do what us normal lazy people do and wait for the ding. This step is an homage to the original Call of the Dead as there is a dial puzzle in the lighthouse at the end of that map's easter egg. Once the dials are set, the Apothecan Blood begins speaking to the player as we are able to understand it and are aided in locating the parts to the Agarthan device. The first puzzle comes in the form of a riddle where the Apothecan Blood ambiguously calls out three random areas where we are to pick up pieces of organic remains. Once collected, the blood states one last location in an opaque manner, only this time this is the actual whereabouts of the Seal of Duality or as Richtofen will call it, the Vril Vessel. After three more snowball headshots to fire zombies, the player builds another bundle of dynamite, melees a bulletin board off of a wall, which reveals a locked safe that needs a bit of coercing to open up. Now that the seal has been collected, we can return to the shipwreck, set it down on the barrel, while the blood begins flying around, waiting to be damaged and then contained. For years, this step seemed like a simple fetch quest where we shoot some arbitrary item in the map and then run after it like buffoons. And while that description isn't exactly wrong, I didn't realize until doing research for this video that the reason for the Apothecan blood acting so aggressive is due to the fact that the blood is alive and was the sole reason for this shipwreck. The whole premise of being contained goes against the very nature of the Apothecan blood and is precisely why it's misbehaving like so. However, this is just a perfect example of Treyarch and Activision's Shanghai talking past one another. Craig Houston has set up and built a magnificent universe that is the Aether storyline and implements the innate attitude of the fictitious and aggressive of Apothecan blood into a quest step, only for it to be executed in a boring, lifeless manner. After the blood has been shot and received enough damage, it will then fire off three fragments of itself to be retrieved. While the locations where the blood lands are technically random, they will always fall into the same areas every playthrough. In order to retrieve them, the player needs to get close enough without spooking the blood and throw a snowball to freeze it into place and then shoot it so that it teleports back to the Seal of Duality. The player will then make their way back, throw three more snowballs, shoot each orb again, collect the seal, place it on top of a bonfire inside of the sunken path, and throw a Samantha music box to turn the flames blue and trigger the next sequence. And then for the first time throughout the quest, we hear from our main crew inside of the forest. Nikolai is leading and providing them with a positive memory and asking them what they cherish most deeply in their hearts. It's at this point in the Easter egg, we get a peek behind the curtain as to what the emotional tone is going to be. While the community was likely expecting an over-the-top final map that was oozing with wild set-piece moments, 
sequence throughout the entirety of its main quest, it was quite clear that Tagder Toten was setting up something different. After listening to our main crew speak, the player picks up the seal, heads over to the lighthouse where both Nikolai and the Hermit explain that we need the elemental shard, and how Nikolai hid it behind the door where Ultimus was locked inside of Call of the Dead. And while the gut instinct is to assume that this is a bit of nostalgia bait to Call of the Dead, the reason Nikolai put it there is because the Cronorium told him Victus would make their way to Siberia to construct the Agarthan device, and he hid it in the only place he knew in that location. And similarly to Call of the Dead's main quest, the player needs to find the fuse for the door and power it up by overriding the map's generators. The Hermit provides us with these strange soapstones that are to be set on a machine inside of the 935 lab, and when set correctly, a fuse will be released for us to place into our inventory. From here, the player must place the soapstones on the backside of the lighthouse and use its trap to heat them up, then travel to the lab area and cool one of the soapstones down. The placement of the hot and cold soapstones triggers the fuse to unlock for the player, then to grab and place inside of the locking mechanism on the outside of the door. Once in place, the player is to shoot two batteries attached to the electrical towers on the cliffside. After that, we must locate three generators and kill an electric zombie next to each of them in order to override the mechanism located on the door. And now that the door is able to be open, we can go and grab the elemental shard. Richtofen, Group 935, Broken Arrow, Purnell, Evil Samantha, Maxis, and the Ascension Group have all been chasing Agartha, the Aether, the power to control time and space as we know it. And here we are, running around an ice pit in the middle of Siberia, closer than any of them to building the Agarthan device. The player is then to make their way back to the shipwreck and place the shard and seal of duality back on the barrel and repeat the same process of damaging and collecting the blood and placing the seal on the bonfire in the sunken path. Now that the player has listened to the second set of narrative dialogue from Primus and Ultimus, it's time for us to take the soon-to-be Agarthan device to the Hermit and survive a lighthouse holdout while he places on the final touches. The holdout section of this quest is definitely one of the highlights as the tight quarters and influx of zombie hordes really push the player to use all that they have for the duration of the lockdown. It is best to train down at the bottom of the lighthouse as there is more room to make an error, but unless you have one of the better wonder weapons in the game, it's pretty easy to trip up and get cornered when you least expect it. The Hermit will call down when the construction is complete and let us know it's time to amplify the power of the device so that we can use it to save the universe. In order to do so, we need to take the Agarthan device and place it in every pack-a-punch machine around the map while killing zombies to collect their souls. This process isn't exactly difficult by any means, but it does take a good amount of souls to charge up the pack-a-punch before it spits out the Agarthan device so that the player can move on to the next location. Another small detail that I think it's overlooked is once the player finishes charging up a pack-a-punch machine, the entire machine breaks down, never to be used again. While of course this is a gameplay mechanic that increases the stakes of going forward since the player can no longer upgrade their weapons, I personally found this step to leave me feeling quite sad once I realized what was happening. The reason the pat machines are breaking down is because the story is over. This machine, which has carried with it hundreds of character quotes and memories of picking up my weapon at the very last second to save my life before being killed by zombies. It's just dead. It's also why the Pack-a-Punch looks the way it does inside of Cold War, because when it was retrieved from the Dark Aether, it was on the mend and needed to be restored by the Nazis in their bunker underneath Nocturne and Toten. Once the Agarthan device is fully packed, it's time to head back to the shipwreck and interact with the blood and bonfire one last time. Once our character dialogue has come to a close, Primus Nikolai will yell at the player to rendezvous at the Golden Pack-a-Punch so that we can upgrade the Agarthan device one last time before entering the final act. This is a very special moment, as not only is this the final Pack-a-Punch in existence, but it was Jebediah Brown's original yet more powerful Golden Variant. Once the player collects all the souls, the Agarthan device will slowly float into the air and emit a powerful searing energy blast that burns the area around it, making Tagder Toten appear to be Hell's second cousin. A large membrane hovers while covering the Agarthan device at the center, gently making its way around the map, protecting the player inside of its circumference. It's up to us to make our way from the back of the ship all the way up to the 935 lab without incident, while zombies ravish Victus as they intuitively know that their existence is mere moments from being wiped away. While the Agarthan device is leading players around, we can see what once was water is now boiling lava, and platforms begin to emerge from underneath, providing an obstacle course for players to hop around on while in the midst of our defense. There are also instances of tense anxiety in between the escorting process, like occasional pit stops that turn the device into a soul box, or heading up the stairs of the lighthouse and leaving the safety of the Agarthan device momentarily to zip line to the lab. The most beautiful aspect of this final mission is just how poetic the difficulty curve is. It
It ramps up ever so gently, becoming more difficult second by second until arriving in the lab and the intensity just increases even further. There is nowhere to run, nowhere to train, no ammo to pick up, no specialist weapon drops. It's just madness until it isn't. Primus and Ultimus will have a few more moments of exposition explaining the truth about Dr. Mani, the Shadow Man, and the Great War. But our mission with the Agarthan device is still incomplete and we need to get back to the Hermit. Excitingly waiting our arrival, the Hermit gladly accepts the device and the player makes their way over to the top of the ship to hear more of what he has to say. My friends, you asked me before what my name is. I did not tell you because I no longer felt like myself, you know? But you brought me back. You made me fall again. My name is Pablo. Pablo Marinos. Once and future hero of the Great War. And I am going to save the universe! Go, comrades. He left that for you. The player then travels to the back of the ship to see what Pablo has left behind for us, and it turns out to be the Agarthan device, which is now ours to claim. Comrades, as we toast our victory, I want each of you to think about what you really want. Where would you like to go now? Believe me. You can have it. must come to an end. The paradox must be resolved. At least, it will be quick. For what we wanted, we got more than we deserved. All the chapters of our lives, good and bad. Even if there was no witness, even if no one cared to see, it still happened somewhere. We fought the Great War over and over, but victory could never be ours. We were always doomed to fail. Monty told us the truth. Our journey is the very reason this madness exists. We are the ones who fractured the universe. This is the truth the Cronorium showed me. The truth Richtofen could no longer face. When we are gone, so too is everything that spewed forth from the ether. Element 115, the Apothecals, even Monty himself. All of it will be banished to where it belongs. 
the Dark Aether. should not be here. Our time has passed. But for all the pain and torment we have endured together, as we leave this life behind, it is my hope that you know one thing beyond any doubt. Look away, Eddie. You are more than just my allies. My brothers in arms. You were my friends. To witness the tragic demise of all of our ether heroes is a punch in the gut that can't be escaped. No matter how many times our crew has died before, they always came back due to the fractured timelines and infinite life cycles they all individually endured. But this time, this time they weren't coming back. Not only did Nikolai end the treacherous cycle in which they were all perpetuating, but he set things right for Samantha and Eddie so that they could live the lives they were meant to live in a universe that was set right for them. While they walked down an empty black corridor towards the light, we hear the sentimental one-liners of Primus and Ultimus telling the player of all the wonderful things that they wish they could have done if they had only been given a chance. Tagger Toten did such an amazing job of subverting everyone's expectations in the community. The way Treyarch implemented and ended the narrative, I genuinely don't think anyone ever saw it coming. And even though a Dr. Monty boss fight inside of a great war map could have been fun, it feels like giving that to fans would have been the obvious thing to do. Whereas this ending, this ending has meaning. It's a strange bit of irony that Tagder Toten's strengths and weaknesses are succinctly juxtaposed in a way that no other zombies map has ever been. A near perfect story that threaded the needle with such accuracy that the community couldn't have asked for anything more. But when contrasted with the other questionable choices, it leaves a bitter taste in fans' mouths when most of us know Black Ops 4's full potential was clearly wasted. And even though the narrative aspect of Tagder Toten was handled exceptionally well, that's just one small piece of a rather large and intricate web that is Call of Duty Zombies. The gameplay, on the other hand, has a lot of wonderful elements to it, such as a variety of wonder weapons, open training spaces, tons of buildables, and much more. But the foundation in which those building blocks are stacked is problematic to say the least. You see, a zombies map is like an engine, and when all of the parts of the engine are working, people don't tend to think about the delicate balances that are taking place. Because when there is one small issue with said engine, it then becomes so blinding that you begin to wonder how that problem ever came to exist in the first place. And a behavior that player bases tend to exhibit when judging any video game of any kind is the concept of isolating the problem. And unfortunately, in game development, issue isolation isn't always a viable path to take. So what do I mean by all that? This means that when a community notices or identifies one singular problem with a map, generally that problem exists for another reason due to other features or design choices that the devs implemented beforehand. And it's in that long line of decision making that the players end up encountering whatever the issue is in which they are experiencing at that time. So rather than sit here and point out everything wrong with Tagged or Toten from top to bottom, I think it's more wise to analyze the core mechanic that Tag's gameplay is built off of, and that is verticality. We wanted to play around with verticality gameplay. We have features such as the flingers, zip lines, and we have a bunch of uh, geometry where we can platform around zombies to get around zombies faster. Now, obviously, verticality isn't inherently a bad idea to implement in video games. It just doesn't always work well in zombies when the entirety of a map is designed around it. Maps like Origins, Blood of the Dead, or even Zetsubo no Shima are vast landscapes with tunnels, underground spots, and secret areas that make the map's exploration level feel rewarding simply by opening things up as you play due to the density of the 
experience. Tagged or Toten could have had a more sprawling layout for players to explore, but instead the map is built upward and relies on verticality and air traversal to enter areas above and below you. Let me give you an example. Shadows of Evil has the teleporters and trains that allow the player to traverse across the map more efficiently, which is not too dissimilar to how the flingers work in Tagged or Toten. The difference between the two is that the portals and trains are optional as you can continue to travel around shadows any way you please and feel the intensity of going on that epic adventure. Whereas Tagged or Toten forces you to travel on a flinger or zipline to enter and leave Group 935's facility on the mountainside. Tagged or Toten simply doesn't feel like it was built to the same scale as any of the other maps on Black Ops 4 due to this verticality mindset. But if the laboratory was brought down to the same level as the rest of the map, I bet it would feel much larger even though it's the same amount of space to explore at the end of the day. There is also a bit of incongruity when it comes to the proportionality of the tight spaces versus the wide open areas, as well as the speed in which the player can freely move. Tag is always trying to slow the player down and it's quite frustrating. This occurs very frequently as most of the small avenues are meant strictly for navigation purposes, and if you get caught in one of these many lanes or caught inside of an open space due to the freezing water, well, you'd better hope you have on Winner's Whale because you'll likely be dead otherwise. This map's architecture causes severe levels of friction on player mobility as moving from small to large spaces is jarring until you realize why the devs designed the map this way, which is to provide reward incentive and pad out content. So in order to combat all of the terrible restrictions placed on the player, the developers created buildables to craft to satiate both the content aspect of the map as well as the rewards aspect. The zip line, the heat pack, and the dynamite are all fine features to have, but they are core mechanics that masquerade as additive ones. So what does that mean. Well, in Zetsubo no Shima, in order to progress through the main quest, the player needs to uncover the Skull of Nonsapwe. And while this process is occurring, you're able to explore the entire map fully without any inhibitions. And once all four skulls have been cleansed and placed into the altar, a secret area reveals itself with a weapon that adds to the experience, allowing you to progress through the end. In Tag, Treyarch just blocks your path and makes you do tedious work to open up parts of the map that should have already been open. Throwing snowballs at fire zone zombies to acquire dynamite will blast open barriers, thus opening up new pathways to speed up travel time and provide shortcuts. The zipline handle is a basic mechanic that is only awarded once the ziplines are cranked in place, and the most important buildable, the heat pack, is only accessible after you repair the flinger's gearbox. I understand that basic setup is imperative to any and all zombies maps, but the problem with Tagged or Toten is the setup only gives you access to the basic experience that the map should be offering from the beginning. This this means that when you load into Tag, you are starting a playthrough of zombies that is design incomplete and are forced to waste your own time putting everything together just to have a base experience. Whereas with Zetsubo, the Skull of Nonsapwe and that underground altar are enhancing the base experience by providing you a special weapon and giving you a whole new area to kill zombies in if you so choose. The only buildable that could even qualify as an additive would be the heat pack as it will prevent you from freezing too quickly in the waters and prevent you from running at a grudgingly slow pace. The heat pack is for sure the best buildable in the map and is quite clever with the discovery process of all the parts, as they are underneath wooden pallets that can only be broken when flung on them while standing in specific positions on the flinger itself. And to be fair, once all of Tag's traveling mechanisms are set up and ready to go, the interconnectedness of the map really begins to shine through. Hopping from area to area using flingers and zip lines and dynamite and the heat pack, it just makes Tag so much more fun to play. But the those elements shouldn't have been used as restrictions for parts of the map's setup. However, it would be a little disingenuous to say that there are no special areas with no special rewards inside Tagged or Toten, as if you look off into the distance you can notice a glimmer of hope glistening in the sunrise. And that is the Golden Pack-a-Punch. The Golden Pap is a pretty special machine in both what it represents and what it does for the player. Firstly, it Pack-a-Punches your weapon fully for a 5k points instead of having to Pack-a-Punch it 5 times in total for it to be fully upgraded. And it's also a reference to Jebediah Brown's original and more powerful Pack-a-Punch machine as he was told to make it by two keepers who came to visit him while he lived inside of Buried. Interestingly enough, even though Treyarch brought back the original method for Pack-a-Punching your weapon, they chose to leave some other classic gameplay mechanics behind. George Romero had such a brilliantly eerie presence on Call of the Dead. It was executed so well, in fact, that I don't think it could ever be replicated again in the current Call of Duty landscape. It's very similar to something like Mr. 
Mr. X from Resident Evil 2, where the player is minding their own business, but they know at any point they can be wiped out by a stronger adversary. It's the type of terror that can't be replicated by anything else other than video games. It's truly that special. And George Romero was the perfect fit for the role at the time. And just like the Pentagon thief in Classified, based on the current timeline, it wouldn't have made any sense to have George on the map chasing the player around anyways. Now, Treyarch did add in a nice little tribute to George in the map by leaving his iconic glasses on the table inside of the lighthouse. And personally, I think that was the right thing to do. And even if they could have found a way to fit him into the map, it just would have been the wrong call. Trying to complete the main quest, the Hermit's Totem Challenges, the High Rounds, or any other number of things would have made for such a bad experience. To simply put it, the way we play zombies today has changed so much. From the engine to the core movement systems, everything is just different. The reason George was so terrifying in 2011, it wouldn't translate to the structure or framework of modern zombies. But that doesn't mean Treyarch can't satiate fans in other ways. Black Ops 4 was also quite an interesting game when it came to enemy variety, particularly in the Ether timeline. It really felt like there was no cohesion for what we could expect with these last few maps, as each of them were littered with random enemy types rather than formidable special bosses like Brutus or a Panzer. Classified has Hellhounds and Nova 6 Crawlers, Alpha Omega has Lightning Hounds, Nova 6 Bombers, and Jolting Jacks, and Tagged or Toten has Hellhounds, Regular, Lightning, and Fire Zombies. And in the case of Tagged or Toten, there is just no threat with these zombies. The only real positive I can think of is the electric and fire zombies will cause elemental damage to surrounding enemies if you shoot them in water or in a horde. And I think this is kind of a positive as the player can treat this like an extra alternate ammo type and then use brain rot or cryo freeze in tandem, thus having a ton of fun effects and variety in the moment to moment action. Another feature throughout Black Ops 4 Zombies that was sparingly used was the challenges system. Inside of the chaos maps, there would be a challenge altar that a player could interact with, complete a challenge prompt that appeared on the screen, and then be gifted with a variety of different rewards. And for whatever reason, this never made it into the ether maps until the very last one. And I have to say that I'm very glad that it did. The challenges themselves are related to the Hermit and will allow you to progress through the quest, which in some ways is kind of a barrier to entry, but the objectives for the player, they're well, kind of weird to put it lightly. The Hermit mostly wants the player to complete various chores, like making soup or emptying jars of pee into the icy cool water. But there are more basic challenges where you have to get things like headshots, kill the zombies with the lighthouse trap, or complete the snowball SOS challenge. However, the rewards for completing said objectives aren't half bad as the player will be gifted with armor suits, extra self revives, and even a passive ability to break out of ice traps more easily. These rewards are good and having passive mini buffs in zombies is always a great thing to have. That being said, when it comes to a reward structure inside of a video game, it's always the journey to get there that needs to be enjoyable, not only the rewards themselves. The main issue with Tagged or Toten's core gameplay ideology is it is lacking any real imagination and tries to withhold content and repackage it as map setup, as well as falls short on its challenge system via the Hermit Totems. The unfortunate part of all of this is that none of these ideas are inherently bad, nor are they entirely implemented poorly. They simply don't provide the necessary enhancement that the devs intended. If the developers found a way to improve upon the already great features inside of Tag, that would change the core experience to a fantastic level. For example, if there was a way to place zip lines wherever you wanted or upgrade the heat pack to make it so that you never freeze in the cold water. And this same story can be told as well with the golden pack-a-punch system as these gameplay mechanics were simply patching holes in some of the messier ideas inside of BO4, making it really hard to sit here and say that there is innovation or progress inside of Tagged or Toten. At the end of Black Ops 3, Revelation set the stage for a bit of a catch-all mentality when it came to using wonder weapons or special features that were map specific at one point in time. So while most maps would have their own unique wonder weapons, Revelations brought over quite a few and stuffed them all into the mystery box. The Apothecan Servant, the Ray Gun, the Thunder Gun, the Ragnarok, DG4s, even Little Arnie's made it in there. It was a who's who of zombies wonder weapons. And yes, the same tradition carried over into Tagged or Toten. Weapons like the Thunder Gun, Ray Gun, Ray Gun Mark II, and even the Matryoshka dolls made their way into this Siberian facility. But of course, that wasn't everything, as Treyarch had a few other things in store come launch day. The new weapon is the Wunderwaffe DG Schafschutze. It's got a sniper scope on it, which allows it to electrify zombies in an area 
from very far away. The Wonderwaffa DG Sharfschutze is not really loved by the community as you can see here by this poll that I posted on my channel. And there is a very clear and obvious reason why. The Wonder Weapon is just not very fun to use. It's not a bad weapon by any means, but it's just not great. And that should be the primary goal for any Wonder Weapon's existence is to simply be great. Ironically, the best part about this Wonder Waff variant is its mini quest to build it as the player has to shoot down an icicle from the lighthouse, which is reminiscent of the vodka bottle step from Call of the Dead. Then the icicle needs to be boiled down, which will reveal a key that unlocks a safe inside of the specimen storage area in the Group 935 labs. Once the safe is open, we can see the very device that Richtofen is obsessed with in order to control the world, the Vril device. After a few souls charge it up, the player returns it to Pablo and is gifted with a key to open a crate in which the Sharfschutze resides. The weapon contributes to solving parts of the main quest and can help to save the player's life up to a point, but at the end of the day, sometimes it's just best to stick with what you know. What else is there to say about the Thunder Gun? It's iconic, it's super overpowered, and it's always ready to save the player's life when the going gets tough. And similar to the Wonderwaff, the player needs to acquire a key from the Hermit in order to unlock the second crate at the top of the lighthouse. And to get that key, we just need to complete all of the Hermit's totem challenges. And while this can be a bit tedious, it really isn't that bad as you are constantly rewarded with those passive abilities that we mentioned previously, and eventually the Thunder Gun itself. The final escort mission can be pretty tough if you go in unprepared. Prepared. But just by sinking in a little bit of extra time and completing those side objectives, the player can be substantially rewarded and turn a rather stressful experience into something much more chill. Speaking of chill, there is one more wonder weapon we need to discuss as the diversity of weaponry on this map is truly unparalleled. The Tundra Gun is one of the more interesting weapons inside of the Zombies universe. For one, it seems to get a pretty bad rap, and I think the negative discourse is simply correlated with what BO4 Zombies was in 2019 and not what it is now. In 2023. If we take a look at that same poll from a moment ago, the Tundra Gun came in last place with only 9% of the vote. That means roughly 650 Zombies fans prefer this weapon over any of the others on that list, while nearly 5,000 people prefer the Thunder Gun. And I really find that discrepancy interesting. After diving back into this map, I had the same preconceived notions as the community that the Tundra Gun was just plain awful. But I used it a lot, and I have to say that it's probably one of the best wonder weapons in Tagged or Totem. It has a high damage output, much more ammo than the Thunder Gun, and a splash damage that also impacts the zombies while it freezes them simultaneously. I think the Tundra Gun's biggest issue is that it's just incredibly boring. But unfortunately, that isn't just a problem with this wonder weapon, but a theme that is peppered throughout the entirety of Tagged or Totem's existence. But there is one weapon on this map that does feel special and that does have a feeling of originality, and that is Samantha's Music Box. After years of seeing that music box sitting around Samantha's room, we were finally finally able to use it to summon the child and suck an entire horde to the depths of hell where they belonged. By picking up the two key cards near the lab, the player can use them to unlock a vault near the third power switch that initiates a lockdown sequence. After killing enough zombies, the event will end and the player is able to pick up this lethal grenade at any point throughout the match. It feels a bit unnatural to be fighting alongside Samantha at this point because there has been so much bad blood throughout the storyline from Moon all the way up through Classified. But now that we are about to make things right with the universe, it's only fitting that she be right by the player's side. Going for high rounds in Black Ops 4 is a bit of a mixed bag in terms of enjoyment, as a lot of the strategies are very much the same and it can get old after a while once you figure out the meta. And in tag, it's even easier if you want it to be. Simply by standing next to this window in the bridge area, you can force a majority of the zombies to spawn there and use the Tundra Gun to ice them out until you get to round 100. It takes about 3 hours to complete and is an absolute great way to get your first round 100 if you have never achieved it before. Of course, the player can do things the old fashioned way and take the wonder weapon of their choice and train or camp in various areas around tag, but since the map is so porous, the zombie spawns are very slow and it will turn a quick and easy 3 hour session into a 10 plus hour match. And just as there is a stacked lineup of wonder weapons, Tag Der Toten also has a fair amount of side easter eggs to dive into. There are multiple music easter eggs as well as two jump scare easter eggs which are fantastic for trolling your friends, but there are also easter eggs that reward the players with free upgraded equipment and even a random perk. The 
The upgraded equipment can also be known as Yellow Snowballs, which again is narratively exquisite but paired with mediocre gameplay mechanics like so much else in this map. To start things off, the player is going to want to pick up snowballs and throw them at four sock puppets located around the map. These represent various characters throughout the Ether storyline that Pablo created as puppet friends since he was losing his mind, living alone for so many years awaiting Victus's arrival. After all four sock puppets are hit, three mini bonfires will appear around the map that need to be filled with zombie souls. Once the step is complete, the player can make their way to the lab and shoot down an organ from a preservation tank and return it to Pablo in the lighthouse. You will notice that Pablo will express gratitude for returning this, but there is an actual reason as to why. He is giving you his thanks because when Richtofen had performed a failed surgery on him, his spleen had been removed and Richtofen thought Pablo had died. But since he survived in this version of events, we are able to reunite him with his spleen, thus being rewarded with a pile of frothy pea covered yellow snowballs. In addition to Pablo's filthy sock puppets, he also carved out some trinkets of animals and other creatures from the ether. One of each of the trinkets is lying behind or next to each of the pack-a-punch machines, and if the player picks them all up when the ice is melted, they can place them in a case off to the left of the old Call of the Dead spawn area. After the round ends, hordes of lightning zombies will spawn in, and if the player survives, they will be rewarded with a free perk. And a good time to use that perk would be right before entering the map's round 200 easter egg. About four months after launch, Treyarch made a tweet stating that the community still had not discovered all of Tagder Toten's secrets. This was followed by a strange clip of Samantha saying don't freeze in a very off-putting tone. Don't It turned out that this was the same insanity mode easter egg from Alpha Omega, but implemented in tag by spawn trapping the player with maxed health and sprinting zombies. But there is a bit of a twist where the player becomes frozen if they don't sprint at all times. This turns an already ridiculously tough challenge into something damn near impossible. And even though it's quite tough to withstand the pressure, it's really a fun challenge and quite easy to enable as all you need to do is stand in 10 specific locations around the map, freeze yourself, and break the ice. But even though these side quests are fun, Fun, simple, or tie in with the story, there is still one last quest that takes the cake. This is the ultimate level of fan service, and Treyarch knows it. The theories that Shangri-La was set on Mars had always been floating around the community, and regardless of if fans were right or not, there was still never any confirmation until now in Tagged or Toten. Man, if Brock and Gary only knew the truth. It wouldn't be a retrospective video if I didn't talk about how awful Rush is for the Ether maps, but to my surprise, Tagder Toten is an exception to this otherwise steadfast rule. The exception is that Rush is 100 times worse on this map than any other map in the game. The simple fact that you can't access the heat pack at all is one of the most asinine things I have ever witnessed, not just in a video game, but in all of life itself. In all seriousness, Tag just isn't a well-designed map for Rush. It's either too confined or too open which leads to poor combat encounters, and then to top it all off, you just don't have the heat pack to counter the icy water. It's really just a mess and should be completely ignored. The Ice Day in Hell Gauntlet was implemented much better compared to Rush, but when compared to all of the other gauntlets, it's probably the worst one because it so closely resembles the general map experience and main quest. There are no challenges that can't be completed ahead of time, so you can just go in with the mindset that all you need to do is all 15 Hermit challenges to unlock the Thunder Gun, and then are going to more or less complete a slight variation of the ending escort mission. And this is quite a shame as I really enjoy the challenges that Treyarch throw at us as they're so wacky and weird and different from the main map experience. That being said, the last four challenges specifically were all pretty enjoyable, especially number 27 which requires you to kill enemies with an unpacked sniper rifle. It's really such a needed curveball to an otherwise dull experience that almost completely mimics Tagder Toten's main quest and ending fight. Tagder Toten is quite a polarizing map to say the least, but once the illusion of Black Ops 4's redemption arc finally dissipated, the community loosened their grip from Treyarch's throat and began to enjoy what was in front of them. And even though I believe there is still a lot of fervor surrounding Tagder Toten and BO4 zombies in general, it seems like fans are in a much better place now after taking time to reflect. Treyarch didn't have to go to such great lengths to satisfy answers to some of the most seemingly innocuous elements of the timeline, but it's in those details that brings this 
map alive in such a way that I have never felt before. While Tagged or Toten doesn't have an ideal main quest, I definitely have a newfound appreciation for it as the developers who created this world for us to explore poured their blood, sweat, and tears into it. And it's such a shame that Activision removed their ability to see it all the way through. And while the developers had their own struggles behind the scenes, the people who end up paying dividends are the community members who have supported the entirety of the Ether storyline for over a decade's time. But somehow, even if the stars would have aligned unblemished, the community would have still been displeased with the end result. And this isn't due to entitlement, bitterness, or resentment, but simply because it's so hard to say goodbye. That being said, no matter which way you break things down, the story needed to end, and Treyarch did the right thing by laying Primus and Ultimus to rest. The art of storytelling is one of the most magical experiences ever created, as stories help to mold and shape many of the lives they touch. For years, the video game industry was overlooked and referred to as inferior when it came to this medium, as many believed games couldn't properly convey affections which touch the heart in a way that resonates with people. And by complete accident, Call of Duty Zombies was born, falling into unknown circumstances of a passionate development team and fanbase. And over the course of a 10-year period, we were finally asked to say goodbye to the franchise in a way I don't think any of us could have ever anticipated. Bidding farewell to Ether isn't what we wanted to do, but what we had to do. And when that passion, that burning feeling becomes amplified across hundreds of thousands of people, it's not so easy to crumble a pillar propping up so many people's lives. Thank you so much for watching another Black Ops 4 Zombies retrospective video. I can't wait to break down the chaos storyline with you all.